it's from others outside of myself in a certain way. And you're taught to respect your elders, you know. Um, you're taught to be polite to women, et cetera, et cetera. We are taught these things. But, you know, when someone makes an act of aggression, just say, biblically speaking, they say that if someone smacks you, give them the other cheek, turn the other cheek. You know, we're taught things like that. Well, in my environment where I grew up was, we heard that, but we weren't taught that. You know, if someone puts their hands on you, you make sure they never do it again. So, your father, did you know what his upbringing was like? Actually... No. No. Okay. Actually, no. I know him and his brother and his sister. My he, uncle, my aunt. He, I, he never talked about how, in his family with his father and all of that. No, Not him really. and his father didn't speak at all. Okay. Um, mm. Which ended up being the same thing with me and him. Mm. He died in 2006. No, he died in 2007. I was, I was on maximum security at the time. He died in 2007. And... They came in. They came that morning to get me for a funeral. No one had called me. None of the, the prison chaplain. No one had informed me that he had passed at all, and I hadn't heard from him in years. And I get to the funeral and find out that it's him. Mm -hmm. You know, they had no idea where I was going and who I was going to see. They told me you're going to the funeral. You know, okay. Well, now I'm wondering who it is and get that it's him, and. Okay. Okay, he gone. I haven't seen him since ninety five. No, I'm sorry. I haven't seen him since ninety six at my brother's funeral. When my brother got killed. And I was facing trial. And they took me to my brother's funeral. That's the last time I saw him. So, you know, the the psych he whatever happened between him and his father, I know because this mark on my nose is almost like a birthmark. Actually I did it myself with another object, an inanimate object I ran into. It. But he had the same mark because his father shot him and the bullet went straight across his nose. And I know that severed their relationship. Mm -hmm. And the things that happened between him and my mom and the mental abuse he tried to instill on us, you know, who loves us after the divorce and the custody rights, et cetera. We had to go over there every other weekend and it's, who love you, who love you, what's she up to? And, you know, I know she's telling y'all that I'm not this, and it's her, whatever, whatever. And it's like, man, look, dude, that's my mom, don't, you know. It's, so distance grows now. Now you separate yourself from me because you can't stand her, and I'm not going to hear you tolerate. I'm not going to tolerate you talking bad about her. So I distance myself emotionally, mentally, and eventually physically, and it had been, it had been 15 or better years since I saw him when he passed. So, you know, no, I never knew any of his history and never cared to know. Never cared to know. Another question. Can you talk about post-traumatic stress syndrome? Yeah, I deal a lot with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, in particular, I deal with um, the CDC. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the CDC's report uh, that um, Post-traumatic stress is considered a, a public health concern because they have found 10 factors of post-traumatic stress that if you have three or more of those, you become, they have a pyramid that, you know, certain traumas happen to you and affect you at an early stage in your life, and then you are affected by this trauma, so you respond in a certain way, cause and effect, basically, you know. Um, in my case, let's give an example. In my case, my father was very abusive, so I learned how to deal with situations by acting aggressively, you know. Um, because I act aggressively, I hang with aggressive crowds. Because I hang with aggressive crowds, we do aggressive things as a crowd. And because you have five individuals who are aggressive in this crowd, the potential for aggression or violence is increased in my crowd now. So the, the chance of me committing a violent act have skyrocketed now because I've been raised by a violent father who taught me the violence was okay, you know. And the CDC have, long story short, addressed that as being a public health concern because if my being real by an abusive father is not addressed, then, then now you have me plus 
five or ten or whatever the case may be in the example other individuals who have three or more of the same traits moving together because you're going to draw together we're going to flock together like we have cliques inside of cliques even in the family you're going to come thanksgiving just look around the table there's going to be cliques inside the family you know and we're all one family so um the CDC has addressed the issue saying that, look, we got to start addressing these post-traumatic stress issues, particularly in the black communities. When I deal with a lot of lectures, I talk about post-traumatic, that I did, that I talk about post-traumatic stress, I bring it up because in the black community, particularly the impoverished black community, we don't deal with post-traumatic stress. Hmm. You know, you, okay, look, boy, it is what it is, get up and deal with it, you know. In a lot of other white communities or other communities, post-traumatic stress has been getting diagnosed for decades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People have been getting diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. In the black community, it's just hard times. It's hard knocks. Mm -hmm. You know, you suck it up and you move on. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that we're sucking it up. Mm -hmm. And we're moving on with this chink in our arm. We're moving on with this traumatic experience and with this engram or this mental distortion of society or relationships or human beings or finances or whatever and we're carrying it forth in life and we're acting out with that distortion in accordance to that distortion or that traumatic experience and so some of the things I deal with I talk about the need to start addressing post-traumatic stress and getting diagnosed and counseling for a lot of post-traumatic stress issues. Because, as I said, it's not that people are born this way, it's a chain link effect. And the quicker we can break that chain, the further back we can clip one of them links, the better off we as a society would be, the more effective we are can be in our work. Um, so post-traumatic stress is definitely um, related to not just prior to incarceration, but the incarceration period. The being incarcerated itself is a traumatic experience. As I said, you know, oh man, just the not even just the physical abuse. I have been beaten with handcuffs. I got two teeth in my my mouth now that I chipped where the guards beat me with handcuffs because I wouldn't stop staring at another officer who told me to close my eyes to him when he punched me, you know? So when I couldn't close my eyes when he punched me, I take the punch and I turn back because if I'm not gonna fight you, the last thing you're gonna see me do is bow my head to you. I'm gonna take all your punches and I'm gonna let you have the fact that I'm not gonna fight back. But I'm gonna let you know with every stare in my body that I wanna kill you for every lick you give me. And my stairs was hurting him. So he put cuffs on to teach me to close my eyes. Um, and that all stemmed from the fact that I went through a strip search where an officer touched me. So I taught him as I was trained coming up that if somebody offend you or touch you or hurt you, you make sure they never do it again. The officer touched my, he touched my testicles in a strip search and I punched him. And I made sure that he would never bother to do it again. They also made sure that I understood that I would never lay my hands on another officer again. So the trauma of that and the problem you have with authority coming after that. That authority figure walk up now, you know. That, how do I look at them? Because the last authority figure abused me, handcuffed me, and beat me, stripped me down. And it was a nurse that had to intervene and say, no, look, you got to stop. Y'all cannot do this. And I suffered bad, broken ribs. They split both my nostrils, split one of my eyes, messed one of my eyes, messed my back up. And that's just a physical trauma of being in prison. You know, the post-traumatic stress of that, the emotional, spiritual, mental abuse, it's untold numbers that people go through. Undiagnosed. And you all are dealing with a crowd of participants and a pool of participants that, for the most part, some of the stories are nowhere near as traumatic or as in-depth as mine 
and some of them are ten times worse. Lost families, broken bridges in every part of their, in every aspect of their life. They burnt bridges and, you know, um, just the whole spectrum that you all deal with. But understanding that some of them are, now today you look at me and you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know half the stuff I've been through, half the stuff I've done, um, or half the things I've seen. Because I've been, <clears throat> God since 2000 slowly, adding little degrees that have changed my course in life. Um, so you deal with people who may seem completely healthy. I, I have a writing I did. Um, and it's called the convict next door. And you know, I'm an uncle, I'm a, I'm a man in a relationship. I am uh, an employee to my employers. I'm the maintenance man or the mechanic that comes and fix your lights or whatever. And you know, I'm, I'm all these things, I'm a mentor and I'm all these things and people walk around me every single day and they have no idea that I barely am I am barely capable of holding a relationship. That I'm still struggling to figure out, you know, basic financial management skills. That I've only had a license for 12 months, you know, or blah 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 blah. You know, it's a million things. So that's just to say that you can look at somebody and you would never know, you know. So you could be here with your participants and you're working with them. And as Jackie was pointing out, you're giving them all these hard skills that you think they need and some of the soft skills you think they need, but you never know what this client, what this participant, excuse me, is actually going through. So sometimes you just have to try to keep that in your mind that, okay, I'm asking you to go do this, but what's the block that's preventing you from doing it? Is it just transportation? Or is it a fear of my little sister, her case, you know, fear of uh, employment outside of the one you've had for your whole life because that's all she knows, and she, you know. Whatever, whatever the case may be, whatever kind of mental block. Um, Daddy, you had a question or something? I see you. Um, okay. I had another comment. I, I thought about the wall back there that we're, very, that we're all very proud of. Mm -hmm. And we celebrate, you know, when someone goes, goes up on the wall. But... Having been here this morning, it seems as if maybe some of our most intensive work may need to take place after people go up on that wall. What's the purpose of the wall? It's anyone who gets a job if they want their picture taken. And, and I guess I would add to that, one of the things that we've learned, uh, and probably maybe Alex as much as anyone is um, just in recent weeks, how much people want to move on from us. We don't take it personally, but I'm just saying, like, they don't want that call, or that's what we get. We, when we try to stay in touch with people after, it feels as though, and I, I think I think we think that it's that project return is associated with that sort of post-incarceration, you know, uh, phase, and people want to get on with oh, life. They want to move on with their lives. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, perspective. And, and sometimes that may actually be the case. Sometimes it might be as simply as simple as some something as small as that. Look, I only understood Project Return to be providing an employment service. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand that you all are here for me in much more as many more aspects outside of helping me find this job. You know that if all I'm looking for is you all to help me find a job, and now that I got a job, better why do you keep calling me? <laughs> you know. I, and then sometimes it's, I have a I have a mentor, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine. He did 28 years uh, for a wrongful conviction, and he calls me sometimes. He like, how you doing? I'm like, man, I'm all right. What you know? To I've been doing this, doing that. No, how you really doing? And I'm like, because uh. <laughs> now I gotta talk about stuff that I'm not even gonna that I can brush over with everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, I can, I'm 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 the king of divergent mind tactics. You know, I can I can divert the attention somewhere else. You know, in a heartbeat. You know, I could play a mind game and take your mind over here somewhere and be like, "Hold on, we're talking about 
you know, and I, I'm the king of it. But sometimes you have individuals who just won't let you get away. They track you down. They trap you down in the corner. You know how are you really doing? Man, I'm barely making it, man. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes the call is that I don't want that. You know, you call me like, and they're like, well, look, I'm busy, whatever. Call me back. And sometimes you gotta, because if all they know sometimes is that you just employment agency. Or sometimes, and they don't look for anything outside of that, so they don't know that, look, when you're calling and ask how things are going, that you want to know more about the, the job. You want to know more than just how the job is going. How are you still holding up, you know? How did that substance abuse plans go? Oh, I graduated. Yeah, but how did it go? Mm -hmm. Oh, man, I struggled through that whole time. Relapsed twice, and man, if it wasn't for that sponsor, you know, sometimes that's what you want to know. They don't understand that's what you're asking. That they don't understand that though this is a relationship you all were trying to establish, not just a service you all were providing, then they don't know to relate to you. So sometimes maybe that's the problem. Hmm. Probably.